Hello there, this is John Evans, and welcome back to a new and exciting episode of Book and Spade. We have discussed how in 1517, Martin Luther nails on the Wittenberg door the 95 Theses and begins what is now believed to be the Protestant Reformation. And in my earlier lectures on the life of Luther, we have discussed how a lot of the Catholicity of his ideas largely stemmed from an Augustinian view of the world. And of course Augustine, of all the Church Fathers, emphasized the need of humanity to rely on God's grace as much as possible, and to avoid any language that would appear, even if it is well-intentioned, that would ever appear to lean on works righteousness as much as possible. And yet, of course, this seminal moment would bring about great divisions within the European Christian family, divisions that remain to this day. And a large part of the work that I have done and hope to continue to do is to heal as many divisions as possible by relying, as Luther did, on the grace of God as much as possible. Speaking of grace, what is remarkable is at the same time, there was another eminent figure a theologian who is admired and considered a saint, Thomas More, who at that time, being Chancellor of England under Henry VIII, would seek to do his best to try to promulgate what he believed to be the continuation of the humanist project, of going back to the sources, the classics, and seeing in them an image of what a renewal of Christianity could look like. He also was, in some sense, a reformer, good friends with Desiderius Erasmus, who would release, some time earlier, the famous Textus Receptus, the famous Greek text of the New Testament, compiled from, at that time, Byzantine sources. But it would launch a new interest in the Bible, and yet more had a different ecclesial view than that of Luther's where Luther's view would be to emphasize the gift, the free gift of God's salvation. For Thomas More, it would be a sense of a return to order, to avoid the powers of chaos that are often released by reform when it is taken too far. Interestingly enough, More's criticism of Luther arose largely, in my opinion, not just from uh, theological disagreements about the question of merit and grace. But also, too, I would say Moore was deeply scandalized by the peasants' revolt in Germany, which led to a lot of iconoclasm, destruction of property, a, a deep sense of revolution in the air. But interestingly enough, the peasants' revolt was condemned by Luther himself, who said that if Reformation was to happen, it should happen through as much as possible through peaceful means. And that ultimately, if we must take up the sword, it must be only in defense, particularly of the innocent. And so we fast forward to this division. We fast forward to the splitting of denominational boundaries. Luther dies and the rise of a new expression, a new expression of an Augustinian emphasis on grace, and of course, Moore dies offering his life as a living Eucharistic offering, betrayed by the very king he sought to serve. And we fast forward many centuries down the line to the 1930s, when we see an, I would say, an agnostic leaning towards deism in C.S. Lewis talking with the Roman Catholic John Ronald Rule Tolkien. And what is amazing about these great and mighty intellects is at this time, Lewis is a skeptic. He loves mythology. In fact, him and Tolkien were members of the Coal Biters Club. It was a, a, a preface to the Inkling Society, where they would discuss Norse mythology in particular. And the great epics of the past, we must not forget that later in his life, Lewis would take his wife Joy on vacation to Greece before her her passing due to her cancer when she was on remission. So these were men well steeped in the past. 
a lover of the great icons and allegories and archetypes that Jordan Peterson now speaks about. Archetypes that point to the transcendence of beauty, but Lewis made a comment that these are merely lies breathed through silver, and we must simply endure the suffering that exists. Tolkien sharply disagreed. Tolkien argued quite the contrary, that mythology, archetype, parable, storytelling is God's imageness alive in us, an impulse to create as we ourselves are created, the gift of sub-creation. Why do we seek to create symphonies? Why do we seek to create even VR realities? Why do we love redemptive plot lines? Because redemption is inherently real. Just because something isn't material doesn't mean it is unreal. And Tolkien used that marvelous word truth, or the truth with a capital T, that irked Lewis. And Lewis responded, but the truth, what, what is this truth? Now, Tolkien responded with a poem called Mythopoeia, where he explained that truth. But in a creative um, adaptation of this conversation that was adapted for EWTN, Tolkien responds to Lewis in this recreated conversation. Whether the words are precise or not, well, that's a matter of conjecture. But Tolkien says, well, Lewis, you put yourself into the plot of the play. Quid est veritas? What is truth? These are the words of Pontius Pilate before the truth himself. Osiris never left footprints on the planet Earth. Isis never left footprints on the planet Earth. If there was a historical Thor, he was the son of a king who died like any other man. And yet, Jesus Christ did exist. And he has left behind an empty tomb. And his eyewitness records found in the Gospels are a witness to that reality. And Tolkien challenged Lewis to look into that image of what Jung called the archetype become real, or as John points out, the word become flesh. And Lewis dug deep. Lewis took that challenge. He investigated. And so it was that the prominent Roman Catholic, John Ronald Rule Tolkien, helped assist in creating the greatest Protestant evangelist, and arguably the greatest Christian evangelist of the 20th century. This is the power of what intellect and friendship can do, and what collective interdenominational authentic ecumenical work can do. The power of the Christian gospel to influence lives, to re-examine their presuppositions, to arrive at the truth incarnate. And ultimately, I would say it was the shared union of the mind of Luther and more enemies in life, now intellectually synthesized in eternity, that allowed for this conversation between Lewis and Tolkien to happen. Now, if you don't believe me, the evidence is on the front page or preface to the Screw Tape Letters, a book by C.S. Lewis which is about spiritual warfare, a conversation, a wiretapping of hell, as it were, the voices of a senior demon, namely uh, screw tape speaking to Wormwood, a junior demon, trying to tempt a soul into the work of their father below. And of course, Lewis wanted Tolkien to read the bloody book, but Tolkien being rather at that time, not wanting to read a, a book about demons, uh, decided to avoid reading the text altogether. So Lewis cheekily decided to come up with a fascinating way for Tolkien to read the book. And that was to dedicate it to him. And on the front page of the screw tape letters, in the epigraph, two quotations rest. One is attributed to Martin Luther, the other to Sir Thomas More. And I could summarize both quotations by simply paraphrasing them as follows, the devil cannot endure to be mocked. This is the power of fellowship. What I've, I believe, rediscovered in my research into the life of Martin Luther 
and I plan on doing more videos, as well as a lot of my work that I've previously done on the Reformation era, is an emphasis on how these ideas have become quintessential to all Christians interdenominationally presenting the good news in the 20th and 21st century. I believe that we are figures who rest on the shoulders of giants. And I believe that there is an opportunity, regardless of our denominational heritage, to learn as much as possible from these minds who have come before. I believe that one of the most frightening things that I'm discovering in a lot of my dialogue is a sense of tribalism, not just between political right and left, but between those who are traditionalists, those who are progressive theologically, those who would want to return to one kind of liturgy, those who want to adapt liturgy. And the one element that we must never forget is that we are called to be family, fellow members of the same bread and body. And if our principle of unity is not charity on the rock of scripture, then what we will find is we will create our firing squads and we will cease to hear the lights of a new Lewis or new Tolkien in dialogue. I would like to encourage that dialogue and I hope that this channel is a vehicle for that work. Thank you and I look forward to hearing from all of you in the comments section.